Good afternoon. Happy Thursday in the markets. We are seeing TradFi a little bit red to end the day. Really exciting to see a lot of this heading into the end of OpEx. We also got some important news from Walmart and some other data that we should be taking a look at when it comes to the demand side. All that and much more today on Money Never Sleeps. Welcome to Money Never Sleeps. I am happy to be here on this Thursday. Having a bit of technical difficulties right now. Oh, there he is actually. Pulling him up in a we'll pull him up in a second. There's my man. How are you doing today, House? Doing good. Got a uh, got a last second call and then uh, my browser would not load. And that is All why good. I am desperately waiting for my new webcam to arrive here so I can stop <laughs> using my old laptop and uh, start streaming off my computer. For sure. I'm glad to have you here, man. So I was just telling everyone a little bit about what we're going to be jumping into today. Uh, I wanted to take a look at some really interesting stuff that we saw out of Walmart this morning, which I think paints a picture of where we are heading in this market. It's also talking a bit about how markets are reacting towards the end of OPEX. And we also got some labor data uh, statistics that we should take a look at because I think people are looking at the wrong number when it comes to some of this job data that's rolling out. And then we also got a lot of a lot of stuff on the crypto front, right? We got a lot of Bitcoin ETF news in that regard. As always, it seems like this week and last week and every other week, it's all about the ETFs. But we got some really interesting stuff there on that end. We also got some really interesting stuff when it comes to regulation in the United States, especially New York, as they roll out stricter guidelines for you know listing and delisting stable coins and other assets on these exchanges. So I think we should start with Walmart. I think Walmart's probably the really interesting story. We can roll into that. But I'm going to share my screen right now. We're going to head over to Market Watch, where the CEO of Walmart is saying that we expect to see a period of deflation in the coming months. I don't think he necessarily knows what that means. Uh, we, we don't want to see deflation. We want to see disinflation, right? So it seems like right now, uh, Walmart, the, the expectations that the consumer is going to have cheaper prices soon kind of tank the stock a little bit um you know i'll pull that up real quick on the side here but walmart seem to have a decent earnings call they beat expectations on both ends but still that doesn't matter it wasn't good enough it looks like for the markets let me stop sharing that let me share our current price of walmart stock you can see that it's down 13 almost 14 dollars today down 8.19 percent massive gap massive gap on this one very exciting to see though right i mean that's what that's what we we enjoy about gaps we like to know that we can fill them at some some point and that's a big boy right there so it seemed like people just necessarily didn't react well to some of that sentiment some of the other stuff that he said was in the U.S. may, may be moving through a period of deflation in the months to come. Uh, we're happy about it, noting that Walmart wants its customers to have lower prices. And that's a great thing for a CEO to say, right? Obviously, we've, you know, as consumers, we've been through a, a shit ton the past few years, past decade, uh, to say the least. But that's not necessarily a good thing because the reason we're probably going to see deflation it, you know, I think we're in a period of de disinflation right now, but we will see deflation sooner than later. And it'll be uh, too late, too little, uh, too little, too late for uh, the Fed to do anything to change that is because demand is drying up across the board. Right. Um, you know, that's just my thoughts right off the bat. We can talk about this a little bit right now. But what are your thoughts on hearing, you know, CEO of one of the biggest, you know, consumer retailers for, you know, clothing, food, pretty much everyday essentials? I mean, it. Honestly, it does not, it doesn't sound good. It honestly, it rings more alarm bells in my head that it's coming from a Walmart than from, you know, any other major market, major marketplace or retailer. And that's because Walmart, you know, their, their thing, their famous thing is their price match and their lowest price guarantee. So mm -hmm. if the company that's famous for selling everything at the lowest and best price is saying, Hey, the lowest prices aren't cutting it. Um, so we need to go even lower and try and find a new supply demand equilibrium i mean that doesn't doesn't sound great right um no. it just it begs the question and starts to almost that that race to the bottom type mentality of okay if walmart's lowering their prices 
who else is going to have to lower their prices around there to compete. Um, you know, so think like other stores that offer kind of that full service market. So like a target, um, and even like Kroger, Giant Eagle, other grocery stores and just other general goods, consumer stores, like you might be able to throw like a Kohl's or something in there. Um, even though they're more clothing than toy and other stuff focused, but no, I mean, it's just overall, overall is just, just kind of worrying for me. Um, and I want to say you, you'd sent me and maybe J web sent me something too, that it was the, the second half of October that Walmart noted there was a sharp kind of drop off there too. Mm-hmm. So I think the other thing coming out of that is what do those numbers look like in the subsequent months? Um, because ultimately, you know, no company is going to want to really get in and go under until they really have to. So I wonder, you know, where does that ultimately land, right? Is it is it something that a lot of pain comes in Q4 or does it come after Q4 once we get closer to Q1 earnings and people are, you know, they can't they can't hide the mess anymore. Yeah, definitely, right? It seems like yeah, I mean, I'm just looking at this right here um on the monthly. It's it Walmart's done extremely well for itself. I mean, over time, you know, even in if we look at I don't know what happened here back in 2014, 2015, but, you know, even in, you know, the crash from 2008 to the bottom, you know, it put in a lower high and it's just been nonstop to the upside for a long time. And I think that's just because Walmart is one of those staples where it's like they always have cheap prices. You know, people don't have many other stores around them in some parts of the United States. We're always, we're always going to shop at Walmart because it just has everything we need. We don't have to go too far. Right. But This is the biggest drop that we've seen since June, or I think it was June, right? Uh, My bad, July of 2022. So this is a really massive drop for the stock today, you know, dropping well over, you know, what it dropped that day itself. But if we look at this on the monthly, I mean, I'm I'm not trying to say, you know, these parallel channels and all this stuff, uh, what do you call it, play out. But it's a pretty big, uh, it's a pretty big parallel channel that it's putting in here. I mean, this is a massive move here from just... 2015 all the way to where we currently are it's been up only for a long long time we haven't seen any type of major retracement in some in some time and when we zoom out of this right so it's really interesting to see that um if we look at on the monthly obviously it's overbought on the daily it's extremely overbought even it's probably going to be coming out of it here but it looks like we bounced right off the 200 ema and we're trading between the 200 and the 50 um we got a massive gap here will we fill that it remains to be seen. Again, I think that this is kind of foreshadowing what we're anticipating going into 2024. And, you know, if, if someone like Walmart seeing pain, I anticipate that this is more in line with what we were seeing in the when we looked yesterday at the Russell 2000 with a lot of those companies as well. Right. So this is one of the big boys that's not necessarily included in there, but maybe we should be. Uh, this is something that's, you know, like I said, foreshadowing to the months, the quarters ahead, because I do think that if demand is you know, blowing up to the point where, you know, 2022, our issue was supply chain. That's why inflation, you know, shot up along with massive printing because pretty much there was no one that was working, no one manufacturing goods at that time, but people had tons of money to spend. It's like, well, of course there's going to be inflation at that point. Now we have this, the opposite where people don't have money and we have rates so extremely high to the point where it's like, yeah, they crushed demand, but they might've done it too hard, too fast. And now it's like, okay, well, Things look like they're getting better, but are they? I think that there's a there's definitely something more sinister behind some of these numbers that we're getting. So even with Walmart, we'll just shoot over into what I'm seeing with the labor market too, which is really important. And it's kind of loosening up. The U.S. labor market loosens as weekly jobless claims uh, hits a three-month high. This is from Reuters. You can see right here that weekly jobless claims increased 13,000 to 231,000. Big jump there, right? And that's just initial jobless claims. The one that's really interesting to me is continuing claims, and that shows that they rise 32,000 to 1.865 million people uh, that are continuing claims, meaning that from the month prior, weeks prior, they are not finding a new job. They're continuing to be on the unemployment the unemployment unemployment list where they continue to try and find some type of work. Well, the way it works is if demand is low and unemployment's rising, there is no way we're going to soft landing in that regard, right? Because if there's no one that's willing to buy their goods, there's what's the need for people to produce them? What's the need for people to service a lot of uh, you know these companies and uh, you know pretty much just work for them if there's no work to necessarily be had? So this is a really interesting thing. I want people to focus on continuing claims because I think that's the that's the the giveaway when we look at this. Um, and look at this right here: manufacturing production plummets 0.7 percent. That's terrible. Um, manufacturing is a huge giveaway. Demand 
obviously with Walmart, it's really big. And then oil, we can talk about in a second, but it doesn't seem like this is pretty much a bull market. I think things are slowing down a lot faster than people anticipate. It's slower than I honestly anticipated. I was on the hyperinflation train there for a while. I acknowledge that that's not the case anymore. I think we're kind of coming to a halt pretty fast, pretty soon to the point that we're looking at disinflation for the time being, but sooner or later, it's going to be deflation. Yeah, no, I mean, I, th- I think you kind of nailed it there. Um, and, you know, we'll get to it later with crypto, but, um, you know, the, the crypto people are generally some of the loudest voices whenever there's any yeah. sort of momentum in the market. And uh, yeah, that, that sentiment's rapidly, rapidly changing already, even just a few short days later. Yeah, dude, it's it's funny how, again, I talked about it yesterday on the show where we're seeing a lot of the smaller cap companies, not necessarily the big tech stocks, but like even in, like industries like airlines and stuff like that, they are down so bad. And this little rally that everyone's having kind of with the S&P and the major indexes going up, you can still see that they're putting a significant lower high, right? This is not necessarily something that's like, oh, no, they put in a higher high. That means we're in a trend to the upside. It's like, no, this is a bit of a correction here. And I'm going to show you guys a chart. And, you know, I was, again, once again, I thought that with everything that was going on in the world, we might have saw a bit of an oil spike around early October. We did, but it wasn't to the extent that I was anticipating. And now we are down considerably when we look at U.S. oil, right? Uh, You know, WTI and Brent have both come down and... It's kind of scary when we look at this because this is kind of adding into that Walmart story, the the labor market loosening up. And now we're seeing that demand is really a big issue in 2023. I think this is the biggest issue right now. Um, Obviously, if we look at this, we're getting close to a death cross when it comes to the uh, price of oil. It's a good chance it could squeeze here. I'm not saying that it's going to squeeze for any reason other than just price going up. Uh, Obviously, people are going to trade both sides of it. But I do think that demand is extremely, extremely fast coming down for oil and what i thought could have been you know an abc correction to the upside has quickly turned into something completely different and now i'm looking at a three-way three-way move to the downside and we could be in that c wave going down right now right um you know i think we topped out roughly around here 94 dollars a barrel it's a good chance that this massive move i mean from 94 dollars a barrel back in september we're currently trading at 72.90 almost 73 dollars a barrel and it's 23.25%. That's a massive drop. That's, you know, and that's a five wave move that we pushed down. So if we are going to get some type of squeeze, it's probably going to be a three wave move up. It's probably going to be short lived. And then we're probably going to see the continuation down. And the thing that scares me about this is if we look at the great financial crisis, I'm going to pull this on the weekly. So remember this, how we shot up significantly up here. If we look at the great financial crisis, we had a really good blow off top in July of 2008. But when the market started to absolutely collapse, it went right with it because demand just dropped off a cliff, right? And I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see oil start, you know, putting in some handles in the 60s. That's going to be a really scary thing for markets because it's just showing that demand globally is drying up. And, you know, we're not seeing it in the in the stock market. The stock market is definitely delayed in that regard. Like, look, we're only down 2% today for the S&P, down 10 for the NASDAQ, down 130 for the Dow. I mean, that's nothing compared to how much we've pushed, you know, past few weeks. Even the currencies are really strange right now, right? We have Euro that's looks like it's getting rejected up here on this parallel trend line, trying to rally in, but then it's just got rejected on the on the daily and the weekly so far. It's gonna be overbought on the weekly. It's overbought on the daily right now. The yen, the hell is going on over there? Uh as much as they try and intervene, just can't get that thing to can't get that thing down. And then obviously the U.S. dollar has been plummeting significantly on some important ranges on the EMAs and on, uh, you know, on the weekly 50 estimated moving average coming to the oversold. I think we are going to get a spike up for the dollar. I think a lot of people aren't anticipating it. Maybe it's not what we think. You know, it's not a bull market as much as a corrective move. Maybe we get something like this, bounce off that, and we push up a little bit higher. But I do think with everything slowing down soon enough, we are going to start to see what's happening in the oil markets, what's happening in you know the small caps, and what's happening in the bond market are eventually going to bleed into the into the major indexes. It's just a matter of time. But these are really big warnings that I think no one is really, uh, at least most bulls and most analysts are not talking about when it comes to uh, you know the headlines and everything like that. Let's see, you got any thoughts on that, or want to just roll over into crypto? Yeah, let's roll over. I know. Let's get into the fun stuff, right? So let's take a look real quick at one thing 
that popped up in my feed that I thought was really interesting. And then we can talk about how the prices are reacting to a lot of this news. And that's the New York Department of Financial, uh, was it Financial Services, I believe. They are rolling out stricter guidelines for cryptocurrency listings and delistings. Pretty much they have to certain crypto uh, currency coins, uh, obviously Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, GUSD, which was interesting, was on, on the list. I believe uh, PayPal and a couple of those other stables and PAX coins as well. They have to have a 10-day uh, approval before they list it from the New York Department of uh, NYDFS. I'm not going to say that every single time, uh, but they have to get that approved whether when they're going to list it or delist it. They've shown that they aren't very favorable to stable coins such as Tether. And they kind of, for Coinbase, who obviously is operating in the state of New York, you know, they're kind of giving them an ultimatum. It's like, okay, comply with this or, you know, comply and delist the coins that are on our, our blacklist, or you have to pretty much cease operations within the state of New York, which I think is really interesting, right? Because Coinbase is like, okay, well, one of those coins is Tether. And there's rumblings for weeks about, you know, possibly a delisting of uh, USDT on Coinbase. Whether they do it, I don't know, necessarily know if that's going to be the case. It'd be interesting if they do, because there is a lot of things that Tether is doing that's absolutely hurting Coinbase and Circle. So maybe they would do it. But, you know, I think this is going to happen not just in New York, but in a lot of other places in the United States where we, you know, start to see a lot of these exchanges have to uh, comply with local regulations along with federal regulations. So we could see, you know, Kraken and Coinbase, which are probably the two biggest exchanges in the U.S., have to comply. Otherwise, they're going to start losing market share within the U.S. or they're going to have to start paying, you know, fines to the point where it's like, OK, you guys are you guys are going around the around the regulations so now you're gonna have to pay a fat bill if you want to keep operating otherwise you know we're just gonna come after you doj is gonna swoop in and i don't know beat your ass but it seems like that's the the way that this is going with um a lot of regulations for exchanges yeah no i mean i think it it kind of adds a lot of clarity earlier in uh the end of august coinbase and circle mm -hmm who's the you know producer of USDC, they had that joint venture going on, they seized the venture and Coinbase took stake in Circle. Um, and the reason at the time was they thought there was enhanced regulatory clarity. So, you know, in retrospect, looking back at that, I think it means that Coinbase was starting to see, you know, the initial grasps against Tether and the action or, you know, assumed that there may be action coming against USDT. And, uh, you know, USDC has been <clears throat> one of the few stable coins that you can actually physically go and redeem the token. There's been a lot of people who have done it. Um, so now it's pretty much going to be closed off unless you're a massive party, right? So trading six, seven figures, then you'll be able to go through to, uh, USDC. Otherwise, you got to go through Coinbase for your redemption. So, no, I mean, I think it, I think it makes sense um, because Coinbase, you know, they've been trying to do the legit thing. They've been trying to say like, regulate us, give us something so we know how to operate, right? So, I think it, uh, it's, it's the smart play for them as far as longevity and you know, remaining able to operate in the U.S. the way they'd like to. Yeah, I think Coinbase is going to be the exchange in the U.S. when all is said and done, right? I think there are going to be some regulations that are going to maybe spook some of these U.S. exchanges or U.S. operating exchanges out of the market. Um, you can go back and forth and say it's Gary Gensler's fault. You can say it's the U.S. not being friendly to crypto. You can say that it's uh, maybe people just don't want to play by the rules sometimes, and that's very problematic for investors, Wh whichever way you want to decide what that is. Um, you know, I think it's I think it would be in both. Coinbase and Circle's best interest if they did delist Tether just because of a lot of things we're seeing between the two stable coins and market cap. And, you know, the big boys that are, you know, redeeming that uh, USDC, you know, they're, they're not retail, right? They're 100% the guys that have the funds to move the markets and they're able to move, you know, 50 to $70 million worth of USDC, USDT, you know, at the snap of their fingers. They have tons of wallets that they're able to do that with. So I think it's really interesting. I also think it's kind of aiding in some ways some of these bitcoin etfs i think it's going to benefit a lot of those in some regard we know that gary gensler is very anti-tether anti-binance apparently 57 members of congress today wrote a letter to biden and uh forget who the other person maybe it was janet yellen uh claiming you know airing their grievances about virtual currency and how this is you know impacting a lot of the things that are going on in israel and they specifically listed uh binance in that letter and they said that it was uh chinese uh what was it? What did they say exactly? It was like 
Chinese linked Binance for funding, uh, you know, funneling cash for Hamas terrorism or something like that. It was along those lines. But it seems like a lot more people in Congress are teaming up against a lot of these exchanges that we've seen problems with. So I'm really interested to see how that's going to impact, you know, I mean, it's going to hurt their market share 100 percent. Right. There's not much volume on the exchanges, even with the price being up where it currently is. But it's definitely not a good look for a lot of those, uh, I would say, tether exchanges or ones that heavily rely on USDT as trading pairs. But I'm going to pull up Bitcoin right now. And we can take a look at this because it is actually down two thousand dollars today. You know, I was just talking yesterday how it was up two thousand. It's back and forth, guys. It's it's in the grand scheme of things, it's nothing too crazy. Again, with how much we've seen these state uh, these alts absolutely rip. We'll take a look at Matic because that's actually having a really bad day too. But that's a pretty good uh, rejection right there. It's a double top rejection on the weekly if we're looking at that. You know, is there a good chance that we could push up still to forty thousand? I think so. If we look at the daily, it's extremely oversold. Um, again, it really depends on the USDT. If we see it start flowing into the exchanges again, it's kind of a giveaway. But yeah, I mean, this is uh, this is definitely a distribution zone. This is a supply zone where people are just offloading and giving to people who are willing to be buying, and a lot of people who are just you know swapping out for stables and redeeming and you know leaving the market. Right? That's what I think, is, especially with all this volume extremely low on the. I mean, it's, nothing's changed in terms of how volume is since March of this year, so. Is it crazy to see it's down 2,000? No, it could easily be up 2,000 tomorrow, or, you know, post uh, close today. So just keep an eye on that. I think they're going to try and keep it up here as much as they can to get as much money out of this market as they possibly can. Yeah, no, I think uh, I think they're kind of spot on there. I think it's we're, we're in for a pretty volatile week, um, and honestly, weekend too. Um, but I think the other thing that's really interesting, kind of bringing Tether and Bitcoin full circle, is that did you see Paulo Arduino's announcement on Twitter today? Was I it recently? Was couple, uh, yeah, he had a tweet recently, and I think the announcement was today. Oh, but, the mining. Uh, Tether just, yeah, Tether announced yeah, they're putting a $500 million investment into Bitcoin mining. Um, that's the man. Which, hey, I mean, when one of your exchanges runs out of margin to loan Bitcoin on, yep. you might want to might want to up your supply. So kind of kind of makes sense, but it'll uh, now it's it'll be interesting to see the impact on Tether too, right? If if any of well, I guess there are a few scenarios to consider, right? Is Tether gets delisted from Coinbase as one, Tether gets like geo blocked in different areas is another on different exchanges that they offer tether they have to like geo restrict now these are all hypothetical i have no idea what's going to happen but i think that'll be interesting to watch the implications of that you know regarding tether's market cap and then also it's that factored in or out you know how well does their bitcoin mining operation do and what does that do for you know all the all the entities related to bitfinex infinex and tether Absolutely. That's a really good point. I, I can believe forgot that just they, I saw that headline today, but it, again, this is, that reeks of desperation in some ways, if you are, you know, skeptical of these exchanges and their, their liquidity, I think that's, I mean, obviously they're liquidating the shit out of people nonstop on these exchanges for the past month or so. But um, I think that it's kind of reminds me of when Binance lost the BUSD, uh, you know, the right to mint it and keep minting it or Paxos, I guess it's Binance. Um, but I think that also kind of let, like we saw them adopt other stable coins that no other exchange really used TUSD, uh, no, uh, FTUSD. Like these are pretty singular to Tron, the Tron blockchain or on Binance itself. I haven't seen many other exchanges that use those stable coins, but even so when they were, um, you know, they were trying to find a new stable coin and they were thinking about an algorithmic one uh post terra luna which is really you know hilarious it's like guys they have no money but they're just trying to trying to make people believe that they have enough to the point where they can trade and manipulate this market again everything that we've been talking about i think since early september is starting to come to fruition and i think a lot of the a lot of congress and a lot of people who are in high places of power that can actually you know start to regulate some of this stuff are definitely getting on board with that and i think a lot of this does come back to the etf and you know, BlackRock's definitely gonna. It's, it's definitely gonna get approved. It's just a matter of one, right? Uh, we saw Grayscale get denied once again. I think there's more to the Grayscale one. I think that there is some type of uh, 
I guess, idea that there could be fraud within, you know, the company itself to the point where they aren't necessarily excited to approve it. And that's why I think the SEC is being a little bit more reluctant on that. And I think every ETF now is postponed till 2024. We're not going to see any till possibly in January, the approvals, because they just delayed everything. So very interesting to see that. I think the grayscale one, we're going to have to wait and see if anything does come of that. Um, but, you know, the price just keeps pumping on these. It doesn't necessarily dump when the news comes that anything gets postponed. I think people just are like, oh, no, it's just time for us to float up more on uh, on some Bitcoin and other alts. But I digress in that regard. Let's take a look at, uh, you want to take a look at Matic? Let's do it. Yeah, because this is an interesting one. Um, it's down a lot today, right? It's down 7.53%. It looks like this one. I'm not saying it topped out because it's once again, you know, it's getting pretty close to, it's going to be an oversold fairly soon, but there we go. We're about to get the golden cross on the daily and look at it dumping. And that's very similar to what we're seeing across all markets, right? As soon as we get that death cross, the markets rally. As soon as we're about to get the golden cross, they start to dump. Um, I think that's just sentiment in itself. And it's also a lagging indicator, but this is a pretty good move to the downside, right? Um, from where we were a few days ago, almost at a dollar per coin, we are currently trading about 13, 14% below that level. So that's a really good move for Matic. I don't necessarily think that's a good move for me at all because it's not enough for me to beat j -Web on this bet. But um, that's okay. We'll we'll survive with Matic being at $0.85. Cents. Eventually, I do think that this one is going to come down. And if we look at this here, uh, you know, it did put in a higher high than what we saw back in May of 2023. However, I still think that if we look at this on, like, let's say the monthly. Man, the monthly just squishes everything. It doesn't look like a higher high to me in this regard, right? So I think that's the importance of zooming out in that and seeing, okay, maybe there's a little bit more of this move to the upside on the shorter time frames, but on the macro, you know, volumes are going down as the price is pushing up. Let's just keep that in mind. We have to zoom out. I think the time horizons for everything have definitely, you know, have probably pushed a little further out in terms of you know, in the calendar year. I think things might play out a little bit longer than anticipated it's, is what it is. Um, it's resilient market, resilient market makers, 100%. But yeah, man, I think this is a, this is a good pullback for this. And, you know, we've seen a lot of alts have really good days recently seeing what is this Binance Binance having a good pullback today. It's down $12.2. Uh, again, interesting, interesting, but that's a bearish engulfing candle right there. 100%. Let's take a look at, Cardano, that's had a good pullback as well. Shot all the way up to about 40, almost 41 cents. Now it's currently at 36 cents. That's a good move. Um, what else is It looks there? like the only token I'm tracking right now that hasn't had a significant downside move is Avalanche, AVAX. AVAX. I think they're, a lot of people are FOMOing on that one. Yeah, they're up from 20, just under 21 to uh, like 21.73, hit a high of 24.09 earlier today. Wow. Um, which is which is which the wildest part, like I almost, I almost FOMO'd in, but when we talked about them, well, it was probably about a month ago now or so during uh, Stars Arena when it first launched, then got hacked and relaunched and burst up into flames. And now it's apparently <laughs> back. Uh, but now there's, there's about a 20% jump been getting from six to seven dollars up to like ten to fourteen dollars and then it came back down um but no i mean it's it's nearly 3x since then if not more depending on you know when you when you got in it's it's moving like crazy though and i think uh part of it too from internal and following narrative is the success of some of the subnets there's been uh, a lot of growth and a lot of adoption towards some of the subnets on avalanche specifically um some of the gaming subnets for some of these upcoming games that people are getting really excited for so i think uh abax is definitely something that'll be interesting to look out for the next couple months yeah, I've always been bullish on AVAX. I have absolutely loved it. And I, you know, I made a little bit of money on AVAX in the last bull market. Um, obviously, it's way lower than where it was back then. However, I think a lot of people appreciate the ease and you know, fast and cheap it is to, you know, transact on AVAX. It's super fast. Like it, it's just it's amazing when you go uh, do that versus Cardano. I love Cardano, but Cardano is slow as could possibly be. And AVAX, you know, I think it's gonna it really comes down to speed and but at the same time. It's going to be really important when it comes to, uh, or is it going? Oh yeah, just gaming in general. I think that's this is one of the bigger gaming blockchains. It's really, uh, it really was a gaming blockchain before you know everything started crashing. But it, you know, I think that 
given time and you know developers building on it it's going to be really big going into the next bull run I, i'm bullish on avex i'm not going to buy it here at all this is the top of a move in my opinion but but uh i definitely think that once we get closer down to like maybe that seven dollar range and maybe less than that i'm definitely going to be you know buying bags of this um but again things could get a lot worse things can get out of hand so we'll keep an eye on that price uh avax is horrible token tokenomics i agree there it is pretty inflationary that's the only bad thing about avax in general there's a lot of coins that are inflationary this the circulating supply is going to continue to increase so not necessarily the greatest thing you want to see but um at the same time, I do think that there is money to be made here if it gets to the right price. And I do think that there is going to be a lot of big things coming in the future. I just can't get Pan Cardano. It does nothing. and never <laughs> gets a lot of hype outside of the Ada Moon Boys. I was an Ada Moon Boy for a long time. I I, I do like Cardano. Um, you know, obviously, that was like one of the first uh, change I started staking with. Um, I did well with actually with staking too. So I, I'm, I always have a soft spot in my heart for it. But I think it's important, again, for projects like that to get in extremely early at the bottom of a market because those do uh, obviously, you know, shoot up when everyone's super excited and we start seeing the rotation of capital out of Bitcoin into the alts for alt season. So that's all I'll say on that front. But um, hey, wait, you, know. you, you know who the other, you know who the other big Cardano moon boy is who's now currently bearish on crypto, right? Who? Well, I mean, you talk about him quite frequently. Do I like him? No, it's Gary Gensler. He was remember he had that video that went viral oh. in the spring of him showing Cardano <laughs> at MIT. I forgot about that. Oh my goodness, I, I don't hate Gary Gensler that much. I, let's put it this way: I think a lot of people hate Gary Gensler because he they think he's anti crypto. I don't think the guy is stupid when it comes to crypto. I think he's just definitely you know very strict and gets in the way of maybe innovation a lot of these companies kind of operating without rules but we do need some type of regulation guys um we can't have this shit going on forever but uh that's that's honestly hilarious i didn't know he was um i forgot that the video came out and i forgot that he actually liked cardano but yeah man yeah i'll, uh, I'll send you the video after the show yeah definitely I'll retweet that shit that way we can all have a good laugh that's i i don't remember that um i didn't even remember that until you brought it up wow Let's see. Let's see what we're doing here. So, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it for crypto, I think. Uh, oh, Solana. Let's look at that real quick because I saw an article yesterday. I think it was from Forbes where they want to uh, – Solana uh, FTX wants to offload like $100 million of crypto per week. 100 mil per week, guys. And then that just kind of gives me some type of red flag, you know, kind of red siren going off in the back of my head knowing that Solana is extremely high and how, you know, how exposed they were to Solana and how that absolutely tanked post uh, FTX, right? Thing is, now it's at a really lucrative level. It's not just at the level that when FTX collapsed, it's above the level where FTX collapsed, right? Now, if they're going to be offloading it, it makes sense that maybe some of the exchanges that very similar to our boys on, uh, you know, other tether exchanges that have been propping up the price of these alts that are making a lot of money. We do know a lot of VCs are exposed to Solana. Wouldn't be surprised if this is just helping FTX maybe get out of a bit of a profit at this point, right? Um, you know, that's maybe a bit conspiracy theorists, uh, you know, consp I don't know. It, it, I definitely think that there's something fishy going on with price of soul being up, you know, significantly against Bitcoin. I mean, it's right now $62 a sh uh, coin went up to about $68. I think there's still room for it to go to about $80, to be honest with you. And that's just me accounting for USDT, still in circulation, still being able to be minted. But uh, again, when I say FTX and Tether exchanges, I mean any exchange that is very pro Tether when they were operating. You know, Kraken has the ability to, you know, one of the only exchanges has the ability to short Tether. But you know, I did some research and I'm like, is, is there a way I can short Tether? Turns out Kraken was one of them. Uh, FTX was also one of them prior to the collapse, right? We also know that Binance does not have any USDT uh, USD on ramps, so USDT is going to be their you know primary trading pair. And the same thing for Bitfinex and Huobi, right? It just seems like any of those that are primarily using Tether as their main trading pairs, those are the ones you're going to want to watch out for. And these are the ones where I'm seeing the most volume driven when it comes to some of these pairs of you know, these assets. So I think that there's a good chance that we could be seeing distribution. I think FTX was thrown under the bus by some of these guys who probably just didn't want them or I, I, I can't give you the exact 
idea for why they did throw FTX under the bus because it, it was 100% a throw under the bus from Binance. Um, maybe there was something that Sam was doing that the other guys didn't like. We'll have to see. This is 100% just speculation. But uh, yeah, $100 million. We'll see if the SEC gets involved in any case with that. But I do think that's a lot of crypto to be offloading. And Solon is very expensive right now. And that could be very lucrative for them if they're able to offload $100 million worth of crypto per week. So one uh, one quick follow up on Sol, because I think it's it's really important to know was oh yeah so airdrops like Ace is talking about mm-hmm. um, I think it's Jupiter Finance and Pith Finance two popular DeFi swaps they both announced token and airdrop so um, you know feel free to go check those out terms and conditions on their sites and Twitter if you're interested um, but then also there were a lot of people i'm not sure if they were just tweeting the the wag me narrative or if they didn't fully you know do the reading or chat you know the on-chain analyses properly or just a mixture of both um but there was a lot of talk on twitter regarding solana that ftx had sold all of their locked soul they were out of out of sell pressure uh no that was just the unlock from that month that they had finished selling so there are, uh, as long as I did my reading correctly, since it's now 2023, every month, the FTX wallets get two soul unlocks. So the second started the beginning of 2022, I want to say. So they have like a 140,000 token and like a 400 to $450,000 token unlock that the beginning of each month, they get those and can sell them. So that that lines up with about what you're saying. Uh, they can they can sell soul up until I think twenty either twenty twenty seven or twenty twenty eight is their final unlock period. So you know they're gonna keep selling it, um, which I think is interesting because it honestly it'll probably help get a lot more money back for the creditors that are owed um, from when FTX collapsed, especially if sole price keeps rising then you got money on the table there's a lot of talk about ftx rebuilding which i would just absolutely hate to see i think if anything you just you just make a new company get the people that you would have rebuilding ftx involved and at least rename the company don't keep operating under ftx and use ftt uh burn burn the smart contract to create a claim burn to create the new token i don't know just just don't do it um, but no, that was something that I wanted to point out because I keep, I kept seeing everyone on Twitter, like FTX is out of soul. It's up only from here. And I was like, I don't, I don't think they're out of soul. I'm pretty no. sure they held like several million tokens, not just $250,000. So yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see how that does, but no huge for huge for soul making the gains they have recently. Yeah, definitely. If you were holding soul, obviously good for you if you're able to buy at that eight dollar level back in december of 2022 i mean you guys congrats you i mean let's put it this way let's let's call let's call for what it is you guys did extremely well because the the tether exchanges wanted to do extremely well as well so for thinking just like they did you guys did extremely well i'm happy i hope you took any type of profits that if you wanted to take profits, I am not a financial advisor. And again, nothing we say is financial advice. We're just two guys sitting here shooting the shit, talking about the markets. Uh, you should always you know, consult with your financial advisor or do your own research before you make any financial investments. It has to be said every time. But the thing that you also said, and we'll wrap it up right after this, about Seoul, it's like there's a few things that are really interesting when it comes to how some of these companies are able to access tokens and i am going to get one once again put my tinfoil hat on here but do you remember when solana had tons of blackouts back in the bull run Mm -hmm. they were just like absolutely blackout the thing is that scares me about that is these are centralized yeah i mean it is more centralized than you know other blockchains right well yes that was that was what they that was what they touched on in the trial was ellison caroline ellison said like and i mean granted it wasn't you know there wasn't any sort of documentation presented that says here's the yeah. here's the on off switch but she did say like yeah we paused the chain we, we wanted to liquidate some people get our get our capital in order and that's the thing everyone should be terrified right now with a lot of the stuff that's going on in tether binance you know Huobi, bitfinex kraken so they do have the ability to turn on and off if they want and have these backdoor these trap doors where they just absolutely are able to move money faster than you're able to get out liquidate into cash right it's the thing that people need to be you know 
acknowledge because we have seen these fire drills, as they're called by Binance, where they pretty much just uh, see how fast they can move money from wallet to wallet in case something bad were to happen. We've seen this on chain. We know that they do run these drills on these exchanges. They just sometimes don't call them fire drills, right? That's something that concerns me still, because if we were to see something that's really bad for one of these exchanges or bad for Tether in any way, we could see that to the point where, say, you know, they're already helping out creditors when it comes to FTX with uh, Solana being so high if they're selling, right? They're not helping retail people who had money on the exchange. It's 100% the people who were help funding that company from the beginning. It's, it's the way it always is. It's the way, you know, when you go through bankruptcy, you pay off the, the creditors first. I'm really interested to see if they are able to get money off extremely fast, similar to how when FTX collapsed and people couldn't withdraw. That's because a lot of people who do have money are able to withdraw faster or they're getting their money out beforehand to the point where it's like, okay, well, at least at least the big boys got out. They don't have to worry about any of these uh, shrimp investors to the point where it's like, you know, sorry, guys, <laughs> you knew what you signed up for. I mean, FTX is an unregulated market. So that's just one thing to keep in mm -hmm. mind because I, I do think that there is no such thing as a good exchange out there. I want people to self-custody because I want people not to lose on this market anymore. And I think the belief that nothing bad could ever happen again in this market while it not being regulated is something extreme, even if it was regulated, is extremely, extremely poor, poor uh, foresight, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I think, uh, I think those are some wise words. Yeah, that's all I got today. Uh, I think we did a pretty good job with j Webb not being here. We're wishing him the best of luck today. Uh, enjoying the weather. I don't know. Uh, he'll be back tomorrow. But we're going to have, you know, obviously we'll be back for 2 p.m. or 3 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Central tomorrow. House, as always, appreciate you being here. You always do a great job filling my spot. And I do a decent job of filling j Webb's spot, hopefully. Uh this is what we do. We love doing it, and we're excited to have everyone here. It's just going through. Randy, thanks for being here. Ace, you have the right idea. Been a while, but here to smash that like from MNS. Like, comment, subscribe. We appreciate you guys being here all the time. And we look forward, I almost said fork. We look forward to, uh, to being here tomorrow with you guys. So take care and be safe out there.